All right, and I will share my screen. Boop, 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 boop. Oh. Don't need that, don't need that, don't need that. Where's my thing? There we go. Take this, put it over there. That will go into show mode. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so tonight we're covering two different things, right? We're covering the getting better data about your learning programs and then leveraging SMEs to create better, to create your programs more efficiently. So the first piece came from a, a book that I got when I was with Rosa at ATD ICE in May of last year. It was one of the pre-conference sessions. We were both volunteering and you know, monitoring the room and such for Patty, um, Patty Phillips. And it was a very math heavy, heady type of um, presentation for three days. I think it was three days where she went through ROI and figuring out all this math stuff around statistics for training programs and how it all worked. But in the middle of all of it was like one little piece that I was like, you know what? I can take that and I can do something with that. And I, I found value there. So what we're going to be looking at is that little piece. And we're going to be talking about leaning into KPIs and business data. And I'm going to work on the assumption that everybody knows what a KPI is, unless you tell me right now that you don't. Anybody? Okay, I saw a thumbs up, thumbs up. Okay. And Jackie, your camera's off and you haven't said anything. So I'm going to assume that you know what a KPI is. So here's the problem that we have today. Your business does not care about how many people registered for a class, unless you're in the business of registering people for a class and you make money on that. But in general, your business doesn't care. They also don't care how many people completed the course. And they don't care about whether the learner enjoyed the experience. Do they want those things? Of course they do. But that's, that's not the goal in a corporate environment of, and when I say corporate, I'm also talking about higher ed and such. That's not the goal of why we do training programs. Um, the problem is that we in the learning field think that this is what they care about. And we think about it, we think they care about that because that's the data that the LMS is going to provide out. When you run reports on the data, that's what it can offer. Unless you're using XAPI or something else that allows you to capture business data in some way. But generally, the reports that you get out of the LMS are how many people registered, how many people completed, did, and, and then these other surveys that you might put together you know, around the experience. So what do they actually care about? Your business seems to care about, from everything I've seen, things like, does their time and training increase the revenue of the, of the business? We're pulling people off the front line, the back line, whatever you want to call it, away from their work, and we're putting them in an event that could be a day, it could be multiple days, it could be a couple hours. What am I getting for that? What am I going to, are, there, are, are we going to get more revenue? Are we going to increase efficiency? Are we, are we doing things that make work better, less errors? Can employees be client ready faster? This is one that I'm dealing with at work right now is it takes upwards of six months to a year for a client, for an employee to come in and be client ready because of the nature of what we do. It's very heavy enterprise level data systems that have a lot of configuration on the back end. So try, and then it's a lot of systems that interconnect. So trying to understand all the different surrounding systems and all the the configuration choices within the systems, people become not client ready for, it takes a while. Um, can an employee self-serve when they have challenges now? Or are they in a situation where they have to constantly ask people for questions? They're constantly bugging other people, you know, and hitting up subject matter experts and things like that. So these are the types of questions that, that come up. Do you guys see questions? Do you see this at your businesses or is this something different? So Barry, I, I see that a, a little bit and where I'm at working uh, facilities at the college. Um, I know 
it's going to be interesting because a, a big priority of our VP is culture and customer service, where I think the culture, it'll be figuring out how we measure that. Probably going to be um, employee engagement type surveys, and then and then we'll have to build some customer service stuff. But definitely the, the getting ready faster is going to be important too. Yeah. And that stuff is difficult, right? Because the element, you now need a different system to capture this data because your LMS isn't going to capture it. You have to either build a, a rise site or no, I'm not even sure that, that that's not even the right answer. Probably something like a Microsoft Forms because you have to be able to get the data out. So if you create like a rise site or a storyline file that asks questions around this, that is this part of the survey that your people take, the challenge that I see immediately off the top of my head is how what reports back into the LMS? Does the LMS actually see the answers to the questions or does it just spit you out a, you know, a percent and a complete or just a complete and a fail kind of thing? What do you got? How do you guys work your LMSs? Is that is that how you see things in your LMS or do you actually get to see the responses to the data, to the questions in the quiz? And I see Jackie has her hand up. Do you really have your hand up? Yeah, I do. <laughs> okay. So that's kind of the biggest issue I'm running in right now. Um, our LMS is Workday. I'm not sure if anybody else is on that. I've got like a love-hate relationship with it as an LMS. I'd say mostly hate. Um, I've got, uh, I'm the LMS admin for my organization as well. So it comes with a uh, series of challenges. The biggest thing I've noticed is as like Articulate's um, software has gotten better, like Storyline has the capability to have these XAPI statements and you can even write JavaScript for them. So it has the capability to capture all this information. But at least in my experience with Workday is it wants none of that. It mm -hmm. is like, did they do it? Yes, no. Um, that's about it. So I've been exploring into, um, LRSs, like learning record storage, um, or even having, you know, storyline somehow like spit out some kind of, um, JavaScript to me as an admin so that I can get this information because it's so valuable. Do you know um, how to do JavaScript? Are you, do you know how to I'm self-teaching, um, <laughs> So, so I'm not an expert in it, but I'm trying to learn it on my own. <laughs> okay, but you are comfortable enough that, that you can play around. I have, um, I was way back when like ActionScript was still a thing for Flash. Like I was uh, taught that, I taught myself um, HTML and CSS. Um, so I have the like skills to teach myself the JavaScript. It's more a matter of like getting that set up and like, where is it going to be stored? And so I've been doing a lot of like workarounds, like building in, like you said, like Microsoft Forms, or um, we use uh, Smartsheet or Qualtrics or SurveyMonkey sometimes to kind of like link that all together. So I get some data, but it's really, really challenging. So I'll give you a little bonus pro tip. I am not going to claim to be able to do this but I know that it works because I've seen okay. people do it. Okay. Inside of Storyline, you can add in JavaScript. Yeah. And what they did was they took the JavaScript and they had they had fields and the fields had variables. Yeah. They sent that data out to a Google Sheet. I'm and they kidding. used that Google Sheet to feed back information either to the LMS or to a dashboard. Oh, that's fascinating. I haven't tried that. And and what it did was it gave them, they, they were able to like tag things for XAPI without using XAPI. It's like poor man's XAPI. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. I also, saw, I also saw somebody do something similar where they fed that data out to a Google sheet and then back to like a PDF. And so I they were able to make I, I've been able to do that successfully um that is pretty cool actually yeah what they did was they made custom what they called them customized like pdfs like learning plans so yeah. you would go yeah. through this thing and you would do like all kinds of questions about where people are at 
and yep. then it would spit back a, a learning plan in the PDF, which was based on a template that basically yeah. just had the same variables that the, the e-learning In the had. PDF. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I've been able to do that. Yep. So Scott, that's that's a presentation you guys should do. You should okay. snatch up Jackie and have her do a presentation on that because it's way cool. We should. But my question is, because we talked about the business doesn't really care about the LMS data. So I'm wondering what data are you pulling from the, the LMS that's helping feed these KPIs and results? Are you so asking me? You or, or Jackie okay. coming up with all those scripts, like what, what information are you trying to get to, to feed your KPIs or your goals? Well, we're getting to that actually, but um, the point is you can ask these kind of, the, the problem that, that I was seeing with Storyline was that if you put in a question like, what, you know, where you ask them about training efficiencies and what things were you able to do because of being in this class now, right? That's like a textual answer that somebody has to write in. And because it's not a, because the LMS doesn't accept the answer that's in the field, it only knows a pass fail or correct incorrect on the score, you can't capture that data back. That's, it's not that you can't ask the questions, it's that you can't get the data back. So, so what we need, what I needed to do was I needed to ask different and better questions. So this is when I, when I, so not specifically for the LMS, but to understand what our, our employees needed, I, we were originally asking, what training do you need? What, what training needs to come out of our team to help you? And that answer was falling on deaf ears. Okay, so that's like the equivalent of saying, I want a better way of watching television so that I can control my time and expecting back in the 80s that the answer you were going to get was a VCR, right? Nobody would have said that because you wouldn't have known it. So the problem is we're asking teams to guess what they need and then tell us and then we deliver that. So that's why that question failed miserably. We saw it took a year plus to get people to just answer stuff in a spreadsheet. They really couldn't do it. I came in and I changed that question to what challenges are your team facing? And immediately those floodgates open. And I would imagine that like right here, right now, I could say, Daniel, what, what challenges are your team, are your teams facing where you work that, that you need solutions for? Why don't you go ahead and answer, Daniel? Do you know? Um, I think our, our organization is in a position where it's trying to find uh, solutions that meet our employees where they are. Okay. Um, while a lot of our departments are searching for a lot of our employees are searching for um stability and consistency so one of the challenges that we're facing as an organization is coming up with solutions that are both flexible and and consistent and stable can you elaborate on consistency um what does that mean i mean i know what consistency means but what does it mean in your <laughs> yeah, i was gonna say that kind of threw me off yeah. um So our uh, Valencia College as, as an institution has evolved over the years. It started off as one campus here and, and has grown. We have a, at least nine campuses at the moment. So we're transitioning from different regional models or campus-based models to a, an, uh, an overarching organizational model. And in that transition, I think that's, that's part of the consistency piece is that certain areas, different campuses do things differently than others. Uh, certain departments do things differently than others. Okay. Uh, so as a training department, mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to figure out how to pull these pieces together, right? Yeah. And make them similar. Right. So as a consultant coming into your environment, I would say, where is the training problem here? And some of it is a training problem and some of it is not a training problem, right? Uh -huh. So 
I would say, do you have consistent templates that you offer to all of your teams? And if the is the answer yes to that or no, you, you don't have that yet. Uh, we're in the process of the, developing some of those. Okay. Yeah. The training solution there is teaching people how to use the templates mm -hmm. so that everybody follows the consistent pattern, right? Um, what about a standards guide? Do you have a standards guide that you've got in place? We got a branding guide. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a start, right? Yeah. I mean, at least everybody's going to have the same colors, the same fonts, the same speaking, the same language. So things like that is so now. So this is how I would dig in with somebody and start going, OK, what about this? What about that? Um, do you. Do you have ways that. So the consistency, what was the other piece? I'm sorry. Um, the, the flexibility to meet employees where they are. Okay, where are your employees? When you say where they are, what does that mean? It, it varies a lot. It could be part-time versus full-time, like job classifications, or it can be uh, employees who work during the day shifts or versus night shifts, um, what, how, what access they have to technology in the workplace. Like, do they work with laptops on a daily basis or are they more on the maintenance facility side where they might not have a desk or a computer. Um, so it, it truly varies in a number of ways. So you're talking about situations on like an iPad or a phone or something like that? Or do they have a laptop? Not, if even that, not not all of our employees need a laptop for work, so they are not assigned one. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. Do they do, do you do face-to-face -face training? Is that the solution? That's one of the solutions uh, is to offer is to come up with offerings and different uh, modalities, try to create uh, opportunities for people in different time zones, not time zones, but um, shifts to to participate in such. Uh, the other solution is working directly with their supervisors to ensure that uh, they allot their employees time to be able to meet whatever requirements are made. Okay, so that's that's a training problem. Do you, do you have programs for your managers that explain to them what their what your expectations are of them? We're we're consistent that's one of our our heaviest focuses right now. Our greatest focus is on the supervisor because as a as an ODHR department like we're we're not big enough to support the entire college. We're just not, and we don't have the resources to do so. So we need to leverage our supervisors to be able to reach out to all the employees. Okay. You might be very interested in the next section of this that we'll be doing later tonight, this evening. Um, I'm gonna step away from you, Daniel. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna do this again with, um, who else wants to go? Karen or Jackie? Scott, I'm not gonna come to you because you're another higher, higher ed. Um, sure. One issue we have noticed, um, so I train leadership uh, management yep. only, uh, but we have gotten um, some complaints this year that we've kind of uncovered from roundtables and whatnot, that a lot of our individual contributors are not being promoted to um, leadership uh, roles, which we have a shortage of, because um, their leaders are kind of like holding them back. Um, for you know like personal reasons or like biases so we've uncovered there's a lot of like bias issues in our mm -hmm. leadership that's like putting kind of like this chokehold on internal promotion and so that's kind of the question like the what challenge is your team facing we're facing a bias issue amongst our leaders right now and we're kind of not even I would say really far into the how do we solve for this because we're looking at like do we have training that would address this already that we can give our leaders? Or is this something that, you know, do we have to kind of develop? Um, so that bias issue is a really big one for us right now. Do you know if your leaders are even able to identify bias in a situation? 
That is a great question. Um, so it, that's actually uh, something that I built into a training that's going out to our leaders um, in the next month or so. Um, it's focused at our newer leaders who are just being onboarded into their roles to kind of address it from the get-go mm -hmm. uh, in order to, you know, really direct your people and, you know, lead to their personal development. You need to understand like your own biases and what that means and how you could get in the way of adding to this like leadership problem that we're having. Do you have like some job aids that that they could reference to show when biases are happening? Not anything? yet. That's something we want to develop. Okay. This is a great place for like scenarios and things like that. But there yeah. may be some pro some chat some solutions that are not training solutions here because there's probably an upper leadership thing that needs to happen. Yeah. And what I one of the things that I would tell you to be looking at is creating leadership development skills for people that aspire to be leaders and require um, that they go through the program before they're even offered the position. Oh, so even address it before they even get to the position. Yeah. And therefore, they can't take that position if they haven't gone through the leader, leadership training. In other words, your company has, this is a, this is like a top-down thing, right? This isn't completely yeah. a training thing. But yeah. if the company says, we won't advance anybody into a leadership role, that's an official leadership role, right? I'm, yeah. I'm in a leadership role, but I'm not officially a leader. Sure. So that's different. But it, but we're not going to give anybody a manager title unless they've gone through the manager program that might be eight months long. That's a good idea. And it just and so you're not specifically fixing the problem that exists now, you're fixing it going forward, but right. you're putting a gate there that says, I'm willing to open this gate, right? If somebody goes through the program, you in your leadership situation know that's a person we need to pay attention to. Right. So, so you're kind of, you're, you're changing the game a little bit if you go that way, rather than mm -hmm. waiting until they're already a leader. And it's already a problem. And it's already a problem, exactly. So just a thought there. Um, is that the only problem you're facing? Um, I would say another big facing? issue is we probably get this at least so like on our sales side a lot, um, probably from the leaders themselves, uh, there's a lot of pushback on why am I pulling my individual contributors off the desk to go to your training? Like what's the benefit? Which kind of like really ties back to your question of right. it's not who or how many, it's why am I even gonna bother letting them go in the first place? Right, so now you need a solution that is not an event-based training. You need yeah. a solution that is like an ongoing small hit, or mm -hmm. if it's, I don't know what kind of training we're talking about, but if it's salespeople, it's probably product training. It's yeah. probably negotiation. It's probably, you know, some soft skills type stuff that, yeah. they can, that they can engage in. But the product stuff you could probably do as job aids or as yeah. like a SharePoint site or something like that. That's a reference that they can go to when they need it. And it doesn't require a training program. Right, right. So, Yeah. We are having the same problem, though, with, with managers, where the managers are struggling because they don't have enough time to give attention to the employees. And I'm trying to use the managers, you know, as that go between to support me. So, but immediately you see, as we change the question, if I just said, Karen, what kind of training does your company need? Are you really asking me? <laughs> sure, why not? I mean, do you know? I don't. <laughs> okay. But if I asked you about the challenges, we could probably have a conversation for a half hour. Yeah. You know, can I just say something? Yeah. As, um, as you guys were speaking earlier and Jackie was speaking, it like hit me and you've touched on this, I think in previous classes about how change management is such an important part of what we do as training people and defining the why right um you know creating the desire of people to go through the training like making it really clear what the outcome is going to be um i just had like a little light bulb moment that that should be built into all of the communication like up front to your point jackie 
A manager shouldn't be asking you, why are you pulling my people off the, the floor? They should already know, like, this is in the best interest of the organization. And with all change management, it starts at the top. So if leadership is not articulating the importance of training, then managers are going to be questioning, why are you pulling my people off the, the floor? That's one. And then number two, I was thinking about your leadership um, program you were talking about. We had a similar situation like this at Royal Caribbean. And we went through this whole like works, like exercise on how to identify the skills that would define what a leader is and built training around those specific skills. So it was an alignment around all leadership about what is a leader at Royal Caribbean need to be successful. And then we started building a pipeline, like identifying high potentials, and having them go through those workshops and that training to deliver on those skills. So just something I wanted mm -hmm. to share there. That's absolutely correct, yeah. So to, to bring this back around, many of the questions that we ask in like a level one survey are things like, did you enjoy the material? Did the training meet your expectations? How would you rate the quality of the training? How would you rate the quality of the instructor? Was the training relevant? So what do you learn from data, from this kind of information? What do you guys, what do, what do you learn from that? Any well, thoughts? I think it's kind of superficial, um, especially like looking at, did you enjoy? Like, obviously you want them to enjoy the material, but if they didn't learn something, then kind of you are just putting them through kind of time wasters. Um, if you're not learning the material, then you're probably not meeting your objectives or it's not designed in a way to meet these objectives. Um, I do think still like the training relevancy one is pretty mm -hmm. important um, because I think there can be an issue. I think of like the learning curve of when you forget something after you've learned it. Like if you're not training people in something that they're not gonna be using right away on the job, they might forget about it, um, sure. which could be a problem. So I think like the training relevancy one is still important, but I could see the rest of them being like more superficial. What if you spun that question though to be, what did you find relevant about the training? Yeah, now, or you can even to tell go, you what was important. like one question that I'm putting on my training surveys now are um, like how motivated are you to use the materials that you learned on the job? And then how soon are you going to be able to use this? So it kind of like reframes the yeah. question while still being like, okay, was it relevant to you? Mm -hmm. Do you guys all have questions like these on your surveys? You probably do, would be my guess. So what if you ask these questions? What's your current level of confidence in your ability to perform the various tasks covered in this training program? And then even you could ask it as a percentage. What specific measure do you expect to improve in your workplace because of your involvement in this training program? So that ties back, makes the employee tie back with their learning to the KPIs that we talked about here. And it forces them to think that way. Now, you could even build this into the course right at the very beginning. Say, hey, at the end of the program, you're going to be asked some questions. We want you to be thinking about them in these, you know, with these, with this frame. With this bent, I guess. Is, so um, of the information included in the program, what are the three things that you feel you'll use in the workplace within the next 30 to 60 days? This is very much similar to what you said, Jackie, right? Um, and what measures do you expect to see improve on the job because of your involvement in this training program? Basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to answer that ROI question. We're trying to get the employee to tie their experience in class back to that ROI so that they could eventually take it back to their, their manager and explain to their manager why it was valuable for them to be in the program. Or if nothing else, we would have this data that we would then be able to turn around and share with management and say, this is what people said. Here's what the program was supposed to do. Here's what people said. 
And we, in 60 days, we're going to measure against what people said, did these things improve? Assuming they all match, right? Assuming the KPIs that are supposed to improve are the ones that the employee said. And if there's a mismatch, then we know there's also a problem because people don't understand the value of what it is you're trying to give them. So these are not questions that you can just get back in your LMS. That's unless you can build your survey in the LMS and the LMS can take you know, sentences and give you the sentences back. That's, that's where this challenge is, which is why you need a Microsoft form or you need a spreadsheet or something to take that information out of the survey that you're gonna ask them. So I was hoping to have something to share around this, but unfortunately I don't yet have data. This is a this question is a thing I've been working on for a year since I was in at, at ICE last year. So in, that would have been May. And I've constantly been saying, hey, I want to add these questions into the survey. I want to add them in. I want to add them in. And the problem is we happen to have standardized surveys for our clients. And so I was struck, and I don't control those surveys. Somebody else did. So I was struggling to get questions into the surveys. And I didn't also, I didn't work on too many things that got surveyed. I worked on larger programs. I worked on a big, large SharePoint site and stuff like that. So it's not until like just recently that I'm working on things that I could put a survey into. So unfortunately, I haven't been able to do that. And I also was asked to create some questions for a survey that's going out on some things that we're calling roadshows. So our instructor, instructors are going to a bank and they're having like a live event and people are coming in. And I wanted to put some of these questions into that survey. Their survey was essentially a test to see if people learned the stuff that was in, this, in the sessions. And I was like, can we add in five more questions that are these data-driven type of questions? And the answer was yes, they wanted to do it. But the problem was that the LMS doesn't take the data, right? It takes the, the, the percentage and it tells you pass fail on the scoring of the test. So that was the easy answer. Mine was the hard. So they kind of pushed me off and they said, well, we'll get back to this and we'll build it for like the second round. And there was challenges, people were on vacation and things. So, so I didn't get to put my questions into the forms to find out of what people were answering. So unfortunately, I can't share with you what happened. So please forgive me on that one. I was hoping that I would have it and I don't. However, I did get a win. I got a really big win. And that win is that I came into my new role and I've shared my role with you guys that I my role is to build curriculums for different teams. And this kind of goes back to this question is the original team that was doing what I was doing was asking the first question and they were struggling hard and they got like very little back and were basically just delivering little micro learnings on how do I do this? How do I do that? How do I do this thing? That thing, you know? So I came in and it took about a month till I was able to start talking to people because I had to build up the connections, the network, and I was finishing off my previous role. But I started having meetings with stakeholders and I started asking them that second question. And in the process of doing that, I literally built like, I think it was four job roles for the client implementations team. And I built another job role for the, the um, client support team. And I think we came up with the number of about 50 or 60 learning paths of content. And in that process, I was able to identify, I think I added up, it was like 50 something hours of content that already existed in our learning management system that we had created that I could curate and deliver as a phase one to, to these different teams. Now, obviously not everybody's taking 50 hours of training. That's over multiple product lines and things. But the point is in a matter of months, we're talking about, I started my job in April. May is when I got to like kick into it. So we're talking about May, June, July, August. We are now four months in. 
I'm able to deliver phase one with all that content without having to really create much of anything. There were a couple of little programs that we decided to create because we needed to fill some gaps. But in general, phase one is going to be delivered. Phase two is the thing that we're going to talk about in the next section. But I, I wanted to share that with you, that this was a huge win that just by changing the question of what I was asking. Like those floodgates opened. And because I wasn't asking them what they needed, I was being a team member and a partner asking them about the challenges. All of a sudden, I've gotten, you know, stakeholders that are willing to participate and they're openly responding to my emails and they're showing up at meetings and adding support and things like that were needed. So this is something that I would absolutely recommend you guys start doing as you're talking to your stakeholders. So where are we at? We are at, wow, we got like 10 minutes. Cool. Um, what do you guys think about this? Was there anything in here that was a big aha of how you can approach data? I know I didn't like tell you, oh, go connect to this data lake and get that data. You know, I didn't do that. But instead, I'm giving you ways to rethink about data and how to go get that data. Because some of this data you might have to get from other people. You got to start asking people what KPIs they use to measure your success. Thoughts? I like the questions. Um, with the questions, would you, which in your ideal situation, would you go back with another survey like 60, 90 days and six months or as opposed to just a one time shot? Potentially. Um, it kind of depends because part of what I'm trying to accomplish is I'm trying to get my big piece of data that I'm trying to go after is the client ready. Is the, or is the person client ready faster? So for me, there's probably a 30 mark survey and there's probably a six month survey. But that's just because that's what I'm, that's the piece of data that for me, everybody has said, we need our people to be client ready quicker. And we also need employees to self-serve when they have challenges, but, um, but it's mostly that third one. Yeah, I think- What do you guys, oh, go ahead. I think we're going to look at with our our onboarding onboarding that we're rolling out. We're going to have the like a 30, 60, six months. I don't know. We're figuring out the cadence, but having uh, them fill out one and then having their supervisors also fill it out. So we can compare the results and see if there's any discrepancies and interesting things that show up there, too. So, Scott, what what teams do you serve? Who are your clients? So my clients are all the facilities people at UCF. So the custodians, the landscapers, I've got some finance, um, housekeeping. So mine are generally, generally mostly blue collar folks, but I also have like planners and architects. So kind of like Daniel was saying, we have a, a very diverse group. Some have very limited computer access, and then we have some on the other end, which are very highly educated. So mm -hmm. we, let, let's just pull out the landscapers for a second. What KPIs do they measure to know if their group is successful and they're doing their job well? I don't know what's being measured for the landscapers. Okay. It's, does the campus look good? But, um, How do you judge whether the campus looks good? Yeah, I, I don't know that they have any any good metrics that I'm aware of. So it's definitely something I need to figure out. Okay, yeah, I mean, that would be a place I would start because if, you, if, if the metric is, does the campus look good, you could probably start by asking people around campus how they feel about the look and feel of the campus, right? And from that, you know, they might go, yeah, well, everything looks great except that area over there. Okay, well, why does that area not look good? And start digging in. And that would give you, you, you could now create your training solutions to solve that problem. Maybe there's funky plants there. Maybe there's certain, the soil conditions. Maybe the, the sprinklers aren't set up right. Maybe, you know, you might be able to figure that out. And then you could train based on that problem. 
Yeah. Some of the landscapers are kind of a, a unique group. At least some of the maintenance custodial have these a system called AIM where they can track work orders and stuff. So okay. we can get some data from there. But the, the landscapers are really out on the island. The okay. So the custodial folks, do they have challenges with um in the work orders you were talking about, do they have problems with errors in the work orders or anything like that? They have some, and, and they're also undergoing a whole big change in how they they clean to be more efficient and timely and improve customer satisfaction. So there's a lot going on. So do they have KPIs around some of that? I don't think they have any... I don't know that they have any good ones at this point. I think it's okay. early in the process. I think they, they need it, but so. It probably sounds like there's just a overall, is the campus attractive to walk around type of a KPI that you get as a sentiment from people, I would imagine. I mean, probably just walk around talking to people, you can find that out. Yeah. I'm not saying that you need to go do that. I'm just saying that, that would be a way to get that data. Um, how about Karen or Jackie? What do you, what are you, excuse me, what are your thoughts on what you're seeing and hearing here? Um, I feel like this is super relevant to what I've been working on. Um, a couple months ago, I read a book. Um, I think it's called Performance-Based Smile Sheets by Will. I um, can't remember his last name at the moment, but it was kind of talking about the same things. Is it um, I think so. Because he's a, He's the only Will I know that's like an expert in the field that people like has written books that people recognize. Yeah, he was taught. I definitely got it off the. Uh, maybe I think I found it on the ATD website. I'm not sure. Um, but he was talking about stepping away from questions of like the did you like it and how was it kind of thing and more into these um, KPI focused questions mm -hmm. and I've completely overhauled all of our training surveys um, after reading that book to questions more of this nature um, and our first trainings with these questions are going out like next week and I'm super excited to see you know what the results are and how they kind of differ from previous training surveys but a couple so you haven't you haven't actually gotten any data yet either not yet next week okay. you're launching them for the first time Okay. Um, but I'm kind of curious, and maybe this is a question to like the full group. Um, do you make your surveys anonymous? And then what do you consider like a successful um, contribution rate? Um, because our trainings for this round, they're all online uh, through Zoom. And so I've built the Zoom sessions where as soon as they leave the Zoom session, the survey pops up automatically. So if they're, it's forced right in front of their face as soon as they leave. They don't really, you know, have to go into the email or into the LMS or anything. It's like put right in front of them immediately. But I'm curious what you guys think about uh, completion rate and then do you make it anonymous or not? Does anybody have any thoughts? I'm happy to give you my answer. I was just letting anybody else speak <laughs> that wanted to. <laughs> okay, so in my, we if we use Microsoft Forms, that captures their email automatically. Sure. So there's no need to ask the question of who are you. Yeah. And we're dealing, the surveys I'm talking about are employees. Obviously, mm -hmm. if they're not that's employees, good. that's a yeah. different question, right? Um, but if you don't need to know who the people are, like if there's not a real reason you need to know, I wouldn't ask their name. Mm -hmm. Is there is there a reason you need to know? I don't think so. The only thing I could think of is like, if they had a really poor experience of like, no, this wasn't relevant and I hated it and I learned nothing and this was a total waste of my time. Like, I'd kind of like to know why. But is it super crucial, like going to make or break? I don't think so. Um, you I can probably add a question it. that's, you know, that asks for their name. Like if you want to make it required it. and say, if you're comfortable doing so. Yeah. Share your name. I feel like people will be more honest if they know it's anonymous. Yeah. 
So by by making it optional, they don't yeah. have to fill it out and then they don't have to give you their name. But yeah. I, my my general answer would be you don't need their name unless there's a real reason you need it. Yeah. Because what you're looking for is you're looking for overall sent, sentiment about things. Right. And you're looking at generalized data and one person saying that they've had a, they didn't enjoy the experience or they didn't get what they were looking for. That could just it's be a the radar, right? Yeah. And, you, know, you could probably take that one out and throw it, throw it away and assume that maybe they were having a bad day or something. Yeah. Um, what, what KPIs are you looking at? Um, so I'm looking at, um, I did keep in the, like, did the course meet your expectations? I'm going to, I'm kind of sitting on that one to see if I'm going to keep it. Um, the ones I'm more interested in are um, how motivated are you to apply the concepts you learned? Um, how soon are you going to be able to apply the concepts you learned? And how well do you understand, uh, like, comprehension, the concepts that you learned? But take that the other direction. What are the what does the business care about? What when they're sending people to you for the training, mm -hmm. what measurements are they trying to what needles are they trying to move? So for this training in particular, we're looking at um, retention. Uh, we're looking at lateral and vertical promotion and um, employee engagement. Okay. How are you measuring employee engagement? That one's an interesting one. Um, my like my parent company does an employee engagement survey, so they kind of handle the keys to that one, and they do that independently of all of us. And then they just kind of release it to us when the results come in. Um, we don't, as a training department, don't have any say over you know what questions go on there. Um, well, but what things do you think inside the company drive mm -hmm. employee engagement? Training would be an asset of it. Um, but I feel like it's just kind of like one spoke of the wheel, you know, of what makes an employee fully engaged or satisfied to be there. So what are the other things? Um, maybe they're not training. Maybe they're business. Maybe it's in their business. What is yeah, it could be business experience. It could be um, a cultural thing, you know, like do they like who they're working for or working with? Um We've got a mix of like hybrid, remote, and fully in-person employees. So it could have something to do with work environment. Um, the company. So are you measuring any of those pieces of data on that side? Not from my training in particular. In the corporate engagement survey, yes, they're asking specific questions about those. Okay, because what you want to be able to possibly do is go, okay, well, we want to move this engagement needle to mm -hmm. move the engagement needle, people need to have training opportunities, which means they need to have time, which to make time, they have to do X. How do yeah. we, how do, from a training standpoint, how do we work on X? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the piece that, that's what we're trying, that's what I'm trying to get to here with what I'm describing. Do I know how to sure. get you to X? No, I don't, because I really don't understand your business at all. But, sure. <laughs> but, but I would be, that's what I would be looking at is X, whatever that is that allows the employee to get more time, mm -hmm. which is probably tied to efficiencies, which is probably tied to errors or this knowledge thing. You talked about retention. How do you, what is the value of that retention? Well, so the training um, that I'm talking about specifically is talent development. We're teaching leaders how to uh, like spearhead their uh, direct reports development because one of the number one uh, reasons that people leave our organization, the complaint they've had is there's no career development there. And so we've been training our leaders on how to do that. So I think we just hit a ding, ding, ding. <laughs> a winner ding, ding, ding. Because the KPI that you're now measuring is how many people leave. Yeah. And how many people are advanced to a new role within the company from that specific leader? Oh, like who's been trained? Right. Okay. So if so, you can identify your your leaders that are actively moving people through the company, either laterally or vertically. Sure. Right. Because because not all not all career mobility is 
is right. up and down, right? right? So, but if if you have a leader that is actively growing their staff and moving mm -hmm. people on in their career, you want to know that, right? And you want to oh, be able to model and, that into other people, right? So that is where. He, so when we talk about KPIs, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, is being able to identify who how people are moving around in the organization. That would be a KPI. So that's not that necessarily team like a survey in. question you're asking. That's like looking at the numbers kind of like separate from the training and making like uh, ties between what you train, who you train, and then the impact it's had yes. as a result. So like you're not really asking survey questions there. Right. It doesn't uh, have to be, a, what I'm talking about doesn't have to be survey questions. Got it. It's how do I solve the as a consultant within your company, you're solving the problems that your company has. And where are the training solutions and where are they not training solutions? And so it's either, it, it could be questions on a survey. It could be questions that you ask to your subject matter experts. It could be, it, it could, it's all of that. Got it. I'm gonna look at that. <laughs> all right, cool, I'm glad we just had a light bulb. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> So Karen, we haven't heard from you at this point in this discussion. Do you have anything you want to add or Daniel? Well, I'll, I'll say for me, um, in my current role, I'm going to use the, the reframing as we're developing, um, you know, programs around like culture and culture immersion. So I haven't done this reframe in surveys yet, um, just because of the nature of my role. But but I do like even the what problems are you trying to solve versus what training you need is a huge one for me. Mm -hmm. um, definitely adding that to my personal playbook because you're right, it gets to the heart of the matter versus you know a laundry list of you know we need happiness training or or whatever, right? But what problem does that solve right. for the organization? Um, now, obviously, if everybody's sad, right. Then <laughs> We need everybody happier and more engaged. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Daniel, do you want to add anything to this discussion or? I, <laughs> I actually put that reframing into practice. It's something that I've done since starting at this position. Previously, our department uh, were essentially yes men. Like they uh, receive a request for training and then the immediately the immediate response was, let's see what we can put together for this like what training can we create or purchase to to fulfill the request um <clears throat> but it wasn't necessarily tied to anything else so I've, I've been actively reframing that uh within our team and trying to teach our team that not everything is solved through training not everything needs to have a training a lot and we've found that a lot of times it's purely a, a, an issue with communication, for example. So we need to think through different ways of sharing information with our employees, um, or it's it's a personal issue where it, training's not gonna solve it. We're gonna need to, to kind of uh, work through it in different ways with employee relations, for example, um, to resolve these things. I like to believe that sometimes it's a job aid and a cheat sheet. Yes, 100%. You know, they they need to be more efficient. Okay, fine. Can we just give them a checklist that if they go down the checklist, they get it all done? Cool, done. Can, you can know, I can have that done in a day. Yeah, can this one hour training be an infographic? Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. All right, so I am at the end of this segment. Do you guys want to take a bathroom break or do we need to, do we want to just plow through? Two minutes sounds good to me. A what? Two minute break. Okay. So we'll Thank go ahead and take a break. That's what the man says. So we'll do that. And then uh, we'll come back here shortly. And pause the share. How do I pause the recording? I don't want to stop the recording. All right. So this part we're gonna talk about leveraging subject matter experts to help you build your learning programs. This is a section 
that has been building for probably four years now for me. And this was the thing, this was the thing that launched me into speaking at conferences. So um, the story I'm going to tell you is that we had a dilemma several years ago. We had a team with two instructional designers that were internally facing. So traditionally, the learning solutions group was a client facing group. They took two of us and faced us inwards. And so they asked us to create some training around a product within the company. And one person was working on one program and the other one was working on the other program. And we didn't work together. We didn't work directly together. So we didn't even know how the other one was solving the problem. And both of us had the problem of too much content. It was way too much content. And personally, I had like 90 days to build version one of this thing about a program that I didn't know anything about, a product I didn't know anything about. I didn't know anybody on the team. And I kind of just made it up. I mean, it was one of those things where we were sitting in a meeting and they said, we need somebody that can do this. Does anybody want to do this? And I went, I'll do it. And I didn't know what I was signing up for. But it was one of those situations that because I was able to solve the problem, I basically built a new career for me at, at this at my company. So it was a career changing moment that I was able to go after. So given this dilemma, knowing that you don't know the product, you don't know the people on the team, you don't know what they need, you don't know that the other instructional designer is having the same problem, and you don't know that the other instructor, how the instructional designer is solving the problem, how would you go about solving this problem? What would you do? Anybody want to jump in on it? Before or after you curl up in a ball and cry? <laughs> yeah, probably afterwards, because I, I, <laughs> I realized what I had signed up for after I signed up for it and was like, oh, gosh, this is going to be a problem. <laughs> I feel like the obvious answer, given the, the title of this section, is you leverage your subject matter experts because there is just not enough time to learn this on your own. That is true. How would you how would you leverage the subject matter experts? What would you do? Well, I feel like the first part is figuring out who they are, because I okay. feel like we talked about that in one of the earlier sessions of like people kind of hoarding information, like dragons, and you know, not really publicly advertising what they know. Mm hmm. Yeah, you kind of have to network inside the organization. Like you start at one person and then you just have them. It's it's that thing of, well, like if you were looking for a job, right? Every time you do an interview with somebody, you say, well, if if, if I'm not going to get the job here, who do you who else do you know that's hiring? Right. So you just kind of keep asking that question to see who else would know about this? Who else would know about this? And you eventually build up a list. Right. So what else would you do? I can use them to prioritize what's important. What, where, where should I focus? What's going to make the biggest difference? And then do you already have content somewhere? Because a lot of times it's already there. Somebody's built the, the wheel. Mm -hmm. You just need to find it. Mm -hmm. So I had when, so I curled up in the ball, like you said, and I was like, oh God, I signed up for something that's going to be crazy. But then I, I knew I could do it. But like immediately, I was like, we are not building e-learning. E-learning is off the table because it takes a month or so to build a single program, like a single class on one thing. And I've got to create a curriculum across multiple job roles. And I have to learn the thing to create the e-learning. And I have to write scripts and I have to record audio narration and I have to build interactions and I have just me. Therefore, that's going to fail and it's going to fail hard. So I needed another answer. So I started asking questions on what was priority. Is production value important? Is scalability important? Interactivity and simulations? Are there textual takeaway, key takeaways? Are there business documents that are available? Is that a priority? Is scripted narration? 
speed to market, facilitator involvement, all of that. And I kind of had to push a bunch of it away. And I decided like production value wasn't going to be important, but scalability was. I needed to be able to scale it because I knew that if we were able to make this work, I was going to be asked to do it again and again and again and again. Or I was going to have to take somebody else and train them how to do it. So I knew that whatever I chose had to be scalable. Um, did it need to be interactive and have simulations? No, that wasn't a requirement. Were there textual key takeaways? Probably. Were there business documents that were going to be important? Probably. Was scripted narration important? No, it wasn't. Um, was speed to market important? Yes, it was. Did I need to have facilitators involved? In the solution that I created, I became the facilitator, but not in a way that you might think of somebody standing in front of a class and facilitating a discussion like I am now. The facilitator involvement that I went after was I was going to become Oprah or Ellen or Johnny Carson or whatever. I was going to be the radio host. I was going to go out. I was going to find these subject matter experts and I was going to interview them and I was going to hit that record button and I was going to turn that into my content. So that's that's where this goes. So. Three things that worked in my favor. I had a constraint on the required delivery time, right? I didn't have till the end of time to build this. I had 90 days and I had to deliver because I was assigned this and I knew that if I didn't deliver it, there was probably going to be hell to pay. Um, we This happened just before the pandemic. So the value of the pandemic was things changed and things changed hard. Everybody was working remotely. So we also were at a time where people were working at home. There were animals, there were kids, there were other family members. This little guy, the camera, the quality of it was not nearly as good as when people held up their phone cameras or, you know, in the past when, you know, the executives wanted to record a video, they had to sit in the studio at the company and they had to get the marketing guy and the marketing guy had to write a script and you needed to have the really high definition camera and the good lighting and all of that. We didn't have to do that anymore. It was okay to sit in front of the webcam and talk. And it was okay if the cat walked across the screen or it was okay if the kids were in the background in the other room, you know, because people recognized that that was going to happen. Because a lot of the feedback that I got was, you can't do that. How are you going to have quality audio? How are you going to have quality video? How are you going to, uh, you know, account for different people's accents and, you know, the, just people that just don't speak well? And I'm like, it doesn't matter. That's when I say, when we go back here and I look at that first bullet and I say production value, that's what I'm talking about. That a web, a web recording was good enough. And good enough was good enough. And because I could do that, and everybody was accepting of it, I was able to move really fast. So, and that's the change in production value was that happened because of it. So those three things came together like in a magic triangle for me and it allowed my project to, to work. So have you, has anybody heard the term orchestrated ID? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, the, the guy in the middle, the composer, is the role that I took on. And I had people all around me that were subject matter experts and I just made things happen. And then I ended up getting lots of video. We, we shot, we literally shot like a Lord of the Rings amount of video. I think when we were all said and done, we had like 12 hours of video from interviews. So I had to go in and I had to edit all of that video. So that was the thing that took up the time, not the writing of scripts and recording and. And I didn't have to get the um, the approvals, right? I didn't have to send the videos back to the subject matter expert for approval because they were the ones that were in the video talking to me. So there was like, there was none of that. It didn't have to happen because I can't, they can't go, well, I didn't say that, you know, or I should have said this other thing instead of that thing. Well, okay, fine. We'll find it. If there's something that was missed, we can add it later because we were using RISE sites and video. 
So the other person, the other instructional designer, ended up with a thing called a SME Wrangler, where she had a partner that would go out and find the SMEs and bring the SMEs back, and she did interviews with them. So this was the second project. And when we found out after the fact how we had both solved the problem, it was a very similar solution. That was, and it was interesting to me that we were both working the same, the same way, without any direction from each other. So, like I said, all we did was I just got people to talk and I pressed record. So, obviously, before I pressed record, there was a lot of discussions that happened. I had to figure out what the needs were. I had to figure out all of the things that needed to be talked about. And then I would have discussions with these folks. And I'd say, all right, hey, we're going to schedule a meeting on Thursday. And on Thursday, here are the questions that I'm going to ask you. And, and we talked through the questions and they answered them to me in that call before we recorded it. So we both knew the questions and we both knew what the answers were going to be. And I took lots of notes so that I knew what the answer was supposed to be. So when we actually pressed record and they started talking, I could have a conversation with them. And if I needed them to get somewhere, I could get the conversation where it needed to go. And I didn't have, because part of the problem with a SME is they like to ramble. And the other thing is, because we're doing videos, we can edit. So if they start rambling and it's something that's not important, we can cut it out. We can also pick up the video segments and move the order, right? So if they if they talk about something and then I go, hey, can you explain what that is? Explain the definition of what that is. And they go into a definition of it. I can cut that piece and I can move it in front of the actual discussion. So as an instructional designer, I can control the final product. So that is how I pulled this off. So the, the other thing that happened in all of this is I figured out that there were problems with some of the people's accents. We had some people that were developers that I ended up talking to that were based in India. And there were some that were Asian and they were based out of like Singapore and Asia and things like that. And it was hard to understand what they were saying. And so what I needed to do to understand what they were saying is I ended up taking the videos and putting them into, um, into Microsoft Stream. And I think some of them I even just pulled the audio and I put them into Microsoft Word to get a transcription. And a light bulb went off and I said, if I need this, other people probably need this too. And so what we ended up doing was we ended up taking key, key topics of things that they said and putting it in the RISE site under the video as, a, as like bullet points and pieces of information. So in other words, you could read the bullet points and understand what was going on without watching the video if you wanted to and still get everything you needed to or you could watch the video, and if you didn't fully understand what was being told, you could read the bullet points below. So you had both of those capabilities. We didn't have some of the tools today back then. Like I didn't easily have a way to do closed captioning. I didn't easily have a way to do train. I could have taken the transcription, I guess, and used that, but I didn't. But, but the point was that we had key takeaways. If they showed a PowerPoint, I would take stills of the PowerPoint and I'd put the PowerPoint down there so that while they're talking and they're not on the PowerPoint, you could still look at the PowerPoint. You could download image. I had images if they were showing images, you know, if since we're talking about software, if there was a software that they wanted to talk about, I'd just share your screen, share your screen, walk me through what you're talking about. There were times when they would talk and they would talk about processes and procedures and they didn't put anything up on the screen. It was just the two of us talking. So after the fact, I would make images and I would dump them into the video that would show the process being animated out so that it made sense to people and they could follow the diagram. So there was augmentation that happened, but it wasn't the equivalent of building a giant e-learning program. So what happened after I did this? What was the result at 90 days? We got phase one done in the 90 days. It took us longer to do the next couple phases because once we did it once, we're like, okay, this worked. People liked it. Here's what we can do beyond that. So the, it, wasn't a, it wasn't 90 days and done, but it was phase one was 90 days. So we had 105 people re respond to a confidence survey that we sent out three months after completing the program. So from that, 
84 people said yes, they were they felt more confident about doing their job now than they did before. We had 96 people say that they felt that it was relevant to the on the job experience that they were having. We had 78 people say that the length of the program was right. And we had requests for future iterations, content they could download for later reference. They wanted more practice experiences and they wanted more ability to assess the skills. One of the things that, that people commented on is they liked the fact that it was not scripted, that it wasn't scripted e-learnings. Now, what we did do is we curated a lot of stuff. So, so this wasn't the entire program. The, impro the program was a combination of these interviews with subject matter experts, curated e-learning that already existed in the learning management system that I could just package. And then there were documents and things like that. There were blog posts that they could read that were already written, documents they could download, PDFs and things of that nature. So it was a combination of things that were also links out to like wikis and stuff that already existed. But the video, the, inter the video interviews, when we had situations like that, the video interviews talked about how to use those tools and how to use the references so that we taught them how to use their, their tools that we were providing them as opposed to reading the tools to them because they can read them themselves. So we added the context to the document. So there was value there. So the overall feeling on the program was a 4.2 out of five. Pretty good, I think. People appreciated the conversational tone of content. They demonstrated that anyone could lead a discussion with a SME. That was the big thing that happened from this is people realized that they could actually lead a conversation and they could do the same thing that I did. And we actually had teams asking for curriculums of content rather than individual programs. And on top of that, we had people after the fact bring us content that they had built because they had been a part of our program. They saw me do it and they said, I could do that. And they went out and did it and said, can you package this for us? So that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, we now have new teams being put in place to support the growth across product lines. And like I said, one participant came to us with content at and asking us to support a program for them. And people embraced the idea that you could crowdsource content creation, that the IDs did not have to own content creation. That was the big sell. I, people did not want to do that. They, they really had a problem with that. I, I, you guys are all IDs, you know, you have ownership problems. I'm, you can probably raise your hand and just say, I do, you know, it's because it's, it's out there. Nobody can create content as good as us, right? Um, the biggest challenge that we saw was teams saying, isn't this training's job? Why are we doing this? Why are we being involved in this? So not every business owner like agreed with this model. And the answer was either top down came in and said, you have to do this. You have to be a part of this. You have to make time for it. Or my leadership said, fine, don't work with that team. Go work with this other team that actually wants to support it. And so leadership has to step in in a situation like this because there's no way training could do what I did without having other people support it. You can't, it's impossible. Um, so we saw scale it, we saw do it yourself. And we saw that it was good enough to do the job, right? So in that case, L&D's job becomes providing the resources for guidance and support rather than being the content creator, which what you're seeing is a switch in the role of the, of the ID. And that is what's happened in my situation is I, I'm an ID, but I'm no longer an ID. I mean, we have IDs on our team and I don't feel like I fit in that group anymore because of the nature of how I've approached content creation. So we also created eight frameworks for SMEs to model because we realized that another thing that was happening in the company was you had people creating boot camps or webinars or lunch and learns or whatever that they were doing and nobody on the training team even knew this stuff was happening. Why didn't we know it was happening? Well, because it didn't. we didn't need to, right? They didn't need the learning management system for that training to happen. So they were just saying, hey, everybody, tomorrow and on Tuesday, we're going to meet and 
for an hour, we're going to talk about whatever. And there's no reason to have people register for that. There's no need to track it or any of that stuff. There's no assessments needed. So the question became, how do we support that? How do we turn around and, and come up with a solution that we don't have to be there, but we can be there? So what we did was we created some frameworks for subject matter experts to model. And the model, the, the frameworks we came up with were Snack and Share, which is essentially a lunch and learn. We're a global company and we realized that it's not always lunch at noon in India or in Singapore or Britain or whatever. So rather than leave them out and make them feel bad, we just called it Snack and Share. Um, recorded interview discussions, that's what I just talked about. A master class, which is like a prolonged webinar. It's basically a three-hour webinar. Um, Self-paced SME created content. So teaching people how to create PowerPoints or record themselves, that kind of stuff. Um, virtual summits, which are like a weekly thing that happens multiple days with lots of videos. Think of an online conference. It's kind of like an online conference. Um, a boot camp, a cohort program, which is what we're doing now. And then informal mentorship and coaching. And we basically made multiple page job aids that teach people how to do that stuff, the kind of questions they should be asking, that if you're going to do a recorded interview discussion, if you were an ID sitting next to them, what would you want them to know? And what questions would you be asking that they need answers to? And then questions around the delivery, because they don't know all the delivery channels. So here's all the delivery channels that are possible. Here's pluses and minuses with each one, things to think about. We also created a essentially a wizard. You guys know what a wizard is when I say that, a software wizard, where you put in a bunch of questions and they fill it out and then it spits out an answer. So if they didn't want to, if they didn't know which model to pick, we made a Microsoft form that was basically a branching form that asked questions around, hey, if I have this situation, where it's like a broad topic, I got 50 people and I wanna record it, what's the best framework? If I have a thousand people on the team that I need to address and we've already got the content in place, but it needs to be live, which one should I pick? And it would spit out an answer. And then that answer would link them to the job aid. And then we also knew that it was very likely that people were gonna wanna be go down this path deeper, right? They're gonna wanna be better presenters. So we created a live workshop around being a better discussion leader. We knew that we didn't need to get into all the presentation skills. We needed to pe teach people how to be better discussion leaders. And those are different things. So this was another tool that we created on the back end to solve some of this problem. How much this is being used? I have no idea. There's no data around it, but it's out there and it's available. And we're adding it into the new programs that I'm working on now. So I'm going to get to that in a minute. But remember this book. We talked about this book earlier, the, the modern learning design. <clears throat> the This book had in it the model that I had been doing. So when people were telling me that they didn't understand what I was doing, they couldn't wrap their head around it. And I kept trying to explain it and trying to explain it to all the people on the L&D team. This book came out and I read it. And all of a sudden I was like, this is what I'm doing. Here it is, guys. Look, it's real. This is a real thing. And this was my, this was my piece that I could hold up and show everybody that what I was doing had merit and had some real methodology behind it, even though it looked very organic by watching me. So there's more to this story, which is what I was saying. So I now have my new role, which I have shared with you guys before. I am now a learning consultant inside the learning solutions team rather than being on the global learning team. And part of what I'm doing is I am working with subject matter experts within various product lines in the banking sector of our business. And I am building multiple versions of what I showed you or what I described. And in the process, I have created like 50 some odd um, learning paths around content with lots of 
content that already exists. I basically duplicated again and again and again across two different product lines. So I've been at, this is what I've been tasked with to do. So by taking on this job role or taking on this project four years ago, it has now led me to a new job role and they literally created a job within FIS for me on my team. So this is kind of what it looked like. We had the global learning team, we had the learning solutions team, and then we have this capital markets learning solution. So when I talk about the banking sector, the other sector of the business is this global, is this capital markets team. So what we ended up, what ended up happening was, whoops, me and my partner who I'd been working with moved over to global learning. And what we found trying to do recreate this solution was that global learning had a challenge. Oops. And that challenge was that they required my partner who was the project manager on the team to work through the business partners to go to the banking leadership executives to, to figure out how to solve their problems. But the people that knew what the problems were were over here. They were the client onboarding teams and the client support teams. These are the people that actually needed the support, but the leadership didn't know how to help them. And what was happening is a wall was coming up and we weren't being able to get to the client onboarding and the client support teams because the business partners were blocking us, which I'm guessing in a large company is normal. They're trying to protect the people on the other side from having to get involved in things that they don't think they need to be involved in. So the solution that we came up with, or actually there's another piece here. The problem that was happening is there were people on the learning solutions team, but they were asking the client onboarding and client support people, what training do you need? That's the piece that wraps this all together, right? They were trying to get to those people and they were failing because they were asking the wrong question. So what we ended up doing was we hid these pieces and I moved back over to the learning solutions team. And because I'm now over on the learning solutions team, I now have direct access. So what was ha so what's happening is this person over here who is my project manager is working directly with me. And because I'm embedded inside the learning solutions team, I'm able to work with the client onboarding and the client support people. Does that all make sense? So we had to come up with a workaround, which I thought was actually pretty smart. And it was very intentional. You know, a lot of people thought I was running away from global learning. They didn't understand what I was doing. And I'm like, no, I am, I'm doing an end run around all of this stuff up here that's red tape that's blocking us from doing the thing that we need to do in the company to solve these people's problems. That's what we were doing. And in the process of doing that, we also learned that Capital Markets was trying to do that. And so I have been working in, in tandem with Capital Markets as well, not as much because I'm still trying to solve my problems over here, but they're trying to duplicate what we're doing. And so they had, they had some of this already figured out, and then there was other things that they didn't. And the things that they've got figured out, I'm probably going to take on as my own, as help, you know, that'll help me, and I'm helping in an advisory role for them. So in the end, what I think we need to do is we need to install another version of me down here in the capital markets, and then Global Learning could manage this type of a product project across all of them because global learning still wants their hand in what training is happening within the company to employees. And then probably need a bunch of little me's here and a bunch of little me's over here so that they can, you know, one person can work with one product and client onboarding and another can work with another product. So we start scaling it to be able to do it quicker, faster, better. But this is how we are innovating. Does this, do you guys, does it make sense? I mean, was this an obvious solution once you saw it? Thoughts? Yeah, this this made sense to me. Um, going back to my 
cruise industry days, um, we did something very similar where Royal Caribbean is the parent company, you have celebrity cruises, you have Royal Caribbean cruises, and then you have the operations team and you have the Marine team. And we ended up with a similar process like this in not really embedding, but like assigning a business unit. So where you had a learning consultant working directly with the VP of hotel operations and his leadership team to help get those other pieces that were like on the other side of the wall and identifying, you know, what was going on in those areas where there were skill gaps, what, you know, problems they were trying to solve. And that ended up being a much more effective way to help those areas than for everybody to sit in global learning. And then you had training requests coming in every which way. Hitting the right. I had, when I was on global learning, I was being split up and I was being put on this project and that project and this other right. project. And they all were moving so slow because there were all the, there was all this political stuff that was happening above my head that we, that drove the speed and who I could work with. I, I couldn't get out from under it. And I was constantly sitting around literally doing nothing for days because I was waiting on other people. And they didn't want to assign me new projects because they knew that the minute they assigned me a new project, the politician over here was going to kick up and I was going to have to work on the thing and it was going to impact the new project they put me on. So yeah. I was this I was in this weird spot, but I was at um, the TICE conference just a month or so ago, and they talked about a very similar style of development. And what they did was they created a role called a learning champion inside of the different teams. And that learning champion is not somebody that work, that is employed by the L&D team. They're employed by the operations team or the development team or whoever that other team is. And they, they have like a 20% role back to L&D where L&D holds meetings with them and they talk about the needs and they help figure out who the subject matter experts are. And when it comes time to get the content, they're there to help get the content. And they're guided by this person who's in the, the training team. So we're back to that SME Wrangler, the, the right. um, orchestrated ID model thing. So it's, it's really interesting to me that what I did, I thought was really innovative at the time. And everybody thought it was really innovative. But not very long afterwards, all of a sudden, all these other people started doing it. And when I would bring this to the conferences, people in the audience were like, yep, that's what we did too. And I'm like, son of a gun. You know, th this was a thing. And I didn't know it. So, again, it goes back to changing that question. I was able to pull off what I did because I changed the question to what challenges are you facing? So, we built learning paths rather than individual courses. So that was a thing that, you know, right now our IDs that, because we grabbed some IDs that came over as well that are now some developers on the global learning team that are helping me. And they're having to wrap their head around the fact that we are not talking about an individual course. We are talking about a curriculum of content and I'm grabbing pieces here and there and that I may ask them to build a piece every now and again. And then here's the things that make up that piece. So there's a change in the development that they're struggling with and they're having to figure out how that works. So we started in May of 2023 and phase one is completed in about four months. I am in the process right now of building the pages inside of our, our, our LMS called WeLearn that will house all of this. So it'll be like, you know, on the product line, it'll be the different job role and then all the different learning paths underneath with their milestones. So 30 days, 60 day, 90 day six months, year kind of thing. So it'll be laid out there for them so they can keep track of what they're doing and where they're going. There'll be badges tied to it and assessments and things like that. I now have a network of 43 people that I can partner with to build this program because I've had to like poke around and figure out who all my players are. We've impacted nine job roles across three product lines and teams. We have 16 reusable learning paths. So one of the things that happened because I was talking to all these different people, I started realizing that many of the problems that people were facing and the things that they needed were the same. But they all saw them as an individual problem. 
But because I'm working at a systems level across multiple groups, I could look at it as a Lego block and go, oh, if I build this Lego block, I can reuse it here, here, and here. And I actually was in a meeting today. I had two meetings today that met this. So I met with a team that was in the client support and they talked about all this, the advanced stuff that they're gonna need that they're gonna have to help me build. And I wrote it all down. Later in the day, I had a meeting with the client onboarding team and I asked them what they needed and wrote it all down. And I said, hey, by the way, most of what you guys have in this list is in the list from the client support folks and the client support folks are gonna work with me to capture that content. If they capture the content, is it going to meet y'all's needs? And the answer was yes. So I just removed a bunch of work from their plate because I don't have to work with them to do it. All they have to do is watch what I build and make sure that there's no gaps. And then if there's gaps, we just fill the gap. So that's that's a pretty cool thing. And because of that, like we had an entire product line that I was able to go grab content that was already in the LMS that was client facing and build the first pass of it without talking to any subject matter experts, because I talked to one person who basically said, yeah, these are the things that we are going to need to make sure they can do. And here's the challenges that we're facing. And here's where we go. And I said, okay, if I collect all of this stuff, does that get us through phase one? The answer was yes. So bam, I didn't even have to talk to a subject matter expert. Um, and then we've got 20 plus focused learning paths that are specific and not reusable. So only one group can use it. So this was all created since May by yours truly because I changed the question. So now y'all can stand up and cheer and go, yay, good job. But you know, I'm not I'm not here for the acolytes. I'm here to say that if you are a team of of small amount of people, you can do the same thing. So my team has four active people on it. There's me. I'm the primary lead on the project. I'm obviously very active. This is my, this is my job. We have my learning solutions manager, who is the stakeholder. She's not very active at all. Basically, we have a weekly meeting where I update her on what's happening. If I have any roadblocks, she escalates. We have the global learning project lead. She's fairly active. She's managing the instructional designs. She's the one that's over on the global learning side, and we talk probably two or three times a week. I have two IDs that are very active, that are building any of the programs that I shoot up their way with content. Or we also have, it's not an or, I'm sorry, it's an and. We have one junior ID who's not as active because they basically are shadowing one of the IDs. Basically, one ID is coaching the other. So I would not consider this an active ID. So really, I have two. So we're back to the design. That's This is really what the design kind of looks like. The ID team used to be over here on the learning solution side, and they ended up moving over to the global learning side. So that's, that's what the structure looks like today. One of these people on the ID team is a junior ID. And I believe that is the end of my presentation part. And we're at 858. So we actually came in under the wire by two minutes, but I do want to offer you guys the ability to um, to chat now that I have really talked for like an hour with a little bit of input from you guys. What do you guys, how did you guys feel about this last piece? Did it, did it wrap everything up a little bit? Did it kind of start bringing pieces together? Or, or do you see how like all the questions at the beginning kind of come back around? Maybe no. I, I I see you kind of squinting, Scott, like you're trying to figure it all out. And so maybe maybe not. No, it's it's pretty clear. Okay. I think the the results of Democrat democratizing that graphic was probably the was pretty powerful. And then the frameworks for SMEs to model, that's mm -hmm. also a way to empower your folks. By the way, I have those available. I can send them out to you guys if you want. I, as sure. I was putting this together, I didn't think about, oh, I should probably make those available. Yeah, that'd be great. 
yeah, I can I can send that out to the group. But yeah, that was a wild ride. That last piece is a wild ride. But um, do you guys see the ability to do that in your own environment? Is there a, does it does it seem like something that could work, or is there a variation on it that could work in your world? I could definitely see it working. Um, but I definitely see the politics when you're talking global versus banking. Oh, yeah. I see that just within my own organization because I work out in one of the divisions as opposed to our central HR and just trying to make sure everybody's aligned and tied up. And people report to different people, so it's not a very clean system. Right. Yeah, you definitely need upper level support to pull it all together because they have to be able to open the door for you. But you can't go all the way to the top specifically because that's where the politics are. So you got to go somewhere in that middle management and find like the manager of the group. Like in my case, it was like the leader of the client support organization or the leader of, of the client onboarding. And then you got to go like one step below to your SME. That's where that person is. And that's what I had, that's the network of people I had to figure out. And then that person goes, oh yeah, you can talk to this person, that person, you know, all of a sudden they really want you to help because you're coming in as a partner. Yeah. What about the rest of you guys? Thoughts? Was it valuable to see this? Yeah, and I think it, it tied back to the first part of the session too. Um, uh, all, like I said, all state actually went through an exercise where they pulled back some of the embedded SMEs into global learning. So, um, well, not even embedded, but they had like, I'll, I'll use claims, for example, they had a learning person in claims. Um, and so they put the entire global learning team together, reporting under the same person, but then having their areas of assignment so mm -hmm. it's similar it's similar yeah. yeah set up it might be a trend in l and don't know how other might be. there might be something there yeah democratizing it mm -hmm. because that's the key the key is the the hardest part is for the instructional designer to let go at least i know that that's what i've seen kind of as i've talked to people about this is the idea of letting somebody else who's a subject matter expert create that content. Once you let that go, it's freedom. It's, it's, it's amazing how freeing it is because when you don't have to worry about it, you just worry about the structure, then the sky's the limit. And all you have to do is really get good at having a conversation with people. And asking questions. That's that that was the thing that I that I needed to do. Did you find that uh departments were more bought into learning and training once the subject matter experts were involved? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Because in the final product, people were like, oh, I know that person, or I know that person. And it was more the way they wanted to learn, right? They wanted to learn from conversations. They they were used to watching YouTube and podcasts and things. And so it was interesting to just have people talk. And it was no different than if they were sitting at the desk with them. Yeah. They, there, was a, there was a hump you got to get past. But once you get past that and everybody becomes okay with it, and, you know, you have to show them examples. People struggled with understanding what was this going to look like. Mm -hmm. So I had, to, I had to get one built and say, here's the idea. Once they saw the idea, they were like, oh, that makes a lot. Yeah, I like that. You know, and they realized it wasn't the next, 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 next style of e-learning. Cool. Jackie, Daniel, you guys got any thoughts? Anything you want to share related to this? Not at the moment, no. Okay. Jackie? Did we lose Jackie? Is she there? I wonder if she went on pause. So anyway, we're at the end. Um, it's 9.05. We do have one more session. The, the session that's there is kind of open forum. 
I don't have content for that session. Do you guys want that session? Do you want an opportunity to bring things to the table and have us all discuss them? How do you, what, what do you guys want to do in the next session? You want to just bring questions and we can just, I, I'm assuming that there's not a lot of questions around the content that's been presented. Granted, that may change after it's been like sits for a week, but I don't want to take up everybody's time if you guys don't have a reason to come together unless you just want to come together. Kind of like Jackie had said earlier that she missed, you know, the gathering over the two weeks. So it's up to you guys. What do you guys want to do? Can we think about it? <laughs> sure. Can we use like Slack? Um I don't want to like give it up right away. Um, okay. But also I want to, you know, be intentional about what it's right. going to look like or what I'm going to bring to the table if we're going to have it. Um, mm -hmm. Daniel, Jackie, Scott, you feel different. No, I'd like to have it, but I don't know what I would talk about. I, think, I mean, I'm happy I to like show you guys. I can show examples of the stuff I've been working on. I mean, if you want me to dig a little more into that, if you, you know, whatever, whatever we want to do, I mean, I'm happy to do it. I just, I didn't, you know, it was like, Hey, we're going to offer a bonus session. That would be a QA session. Cause again, I thought there would be a larger crowd and that people would want to discuss stuff. No, I think if you have stuff that you want to show off, like some of the stuff you've talked about, some of the frameworks and, maybe some of the products, that'd be cool. Um, I'm happy to do that. If, you, if if that's what you guys would like to do, I'm happy to show you what we created. And then mastermind, if anybody has questions, kind of like you're doing the end of that first yeah. album. And then I saw Jackie just came off mute, so. Oh, and she's got a thumb up now. I was, yeah, I was gonna agree with what you were saying, Scott. Um, I think it'd be pretty fun to see kind of what you're working on and what you've produced. Um, and then I also kind of, I don't know, I think in the week it might be, um, I should have my first round of like surveys back for oh, you know, these different style questions. So maybe I could bring that if it's anything um, prudent to bring forward or if it's, you know, a total bust even just to talk about it and see how the Yeah, yeah I think you should bring it forward been. either way. Yeah, I could totally do that. You know, and if it's a bust, we can maybe see why was it a bust or, you know, yeah. what would you tell us? Yeah, I think that would be cool. Okay, so I guess the answer is yes. I guess we're going to have next week. All right. Well, everybody have a great night. Thank you all for hanging out tonight and, and sharing with us back. You know, I, I don't want this to be a one-way discussion. I like the fact that it's a two-way discussion or a multi-way discussion, I guess. <laughs> yeah, great discussion tonight. Yep. Yeah. All right. So I guess we'll talk to y'all later. All right, Scott, bye. you're going to send me the recording, right? All right. Cool. Thanks. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.